Let's start now with respect to novel therapies and treatment approach in the patients that actually have relapse refractory disease. I think we can move along based on the knowledge we've learned from the previous uh, patients who have previously untreated. But I guess I'll, ask, I'll start with John. How have novel therapies changed your approach, basically, to the treatment of the relapse refractory patient with respect to what do you utilize now that what you were using, say, a year or two ago? Yeah, so it, it's made what was a very complicated discussion mm -hmm. a, a year ago very easy. Okay. Yeah, um, because uh, you know there are all the regimens we used to use for relapse and refractory CLL, bendamustine, rituximab, FCR, ofatumumab, um, say lenalidomide, on and on. Say to now, you know, ir ir irrespective of what your genetic markers are, you're going to get something in our practice unless unless you have, you're on warfarin, or you have a, a reason, a real reason not to use ibrutinib. That's going to be your second line therapy, because you know, say the randomized you know the randomized study shows it's superior to ofatumumab. The relapse you know, rate with that with those agents are low, and they're a very they're a tolerable therapy. Ibrutinib is not a therapy without side effects, but it's a therapy that most patients tolerate well. In my experience, much better than you know than chemotherapy or other salvage regimens that we give. And, and the responses and, and the progression-free survival is durable in most patients, with the exception of the se the 17P and maybe the you know and the complex carry type. Complex carry type is you know is very important for risk to relapse in the in the uh, in the second line. I wonder if you could just comment on other people on the panel. Is that you know I've I've discussed this. I've thought about this. Is any monotherapy? I don't care what it is. Is actually it, it's good if it's well tolerated but you don't get as much bang for your buck as when you use combination agents. And I don't have to say toxic combination agents because we know that there's data that if we add, uh, say, an, a biologic or an antibody, we're going to actually decrease the peripheral lymphocytosis that we see when we initiate um, either idelazip or ibrutinib. So I guess the question is, do you foresee that, you know, how long, how far, is it going to be in the near future that we're going to really be using, utilizing combination therapy and maybe a set number. I really think that that's my view of the, the vision for the use of these agents. Instead of just using the single therapy long time, why don't we combine them? And what we were saying before was uh, we're saying with Tom, maybe stopping, seeing what happens, and then if actually they're still sensitive when we took them off therapy, hopefully they'll still be sensitive to that treatment again. Well, I think uh, that's what we do as oncologists is mm -hmm. to combine things with each other and. I think combinations have a certain rationale as you just laid out. However, I think we have to always look at the data too. And I know that Dr. Bird conducted studies uh, with the ibrutinib maybe inhibiting other kinases that might be involved in the activity of these antibodies. It calls into question how effective the antibody is in the setting of someone who's being treated with ibrutinib. I think that uh, obviously we may lower the lymphocytosis, but what's striking to me in the early reporting of the data is that the complete remission rate in patients treated with ibrutinib and rituximab is not a whole lot different than patients treated with ibrutinib alone. So we're, like they say, where's the beef? Yeah, right. And uh, I think if we're not getting an increased bang for our buck, is okay. it worth spending more bucks for right. nothing? So or maybe well, there's other agents. So there may be other test. agents right. involved, and I think that has to be data-driven. So just sure. combining things because they have different uh, mechanisms of action uh, doesn't always work. So we need the data, and we actually realize We have to that demonstrate the need. Most importantly, well, it's saying the need is that it's very expensive, and to use it for three years when I can use something for six months, I think there's a need for us to be cautious as to how we can actually improve, decrease the cost of these very excellent therapies, improve outcomes, but shorten them as well. I, you know, I, I don't, I do have, you know, philosophically believe that you know our job is to take care of the patients, and right. it's somebody else's job to come up with the pain scheme. And so well, I, I don't I, agree with you totally with that because I think we have to be responsible as well for that. But I think that you know right now when we're looking at adding additional therapies, there are the sure. potential risks of adding additional therapies. And when you look at the patients who are being well, I'm treated not with in the community, single, but don't you think they should be treated? They should be. We should have trials which are ongoing, which may guide us. But I, I want to hear what you have to say. So absolutely, I believe in the ongoing trials, looking at adding right. other agents to see if we can shorten therapy. Right. Be this taking a B cell receptor 
antagonist as a debulking agent followed by ABT199 or using something like ABT199 or abinutuzumab or some other agent to mop up residual disease. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, is by and large, you know, these patients were getting single agent ibrutinib who were, at least in this treatment naive cohort, yeah. have an incredibly low risk of progression, an incredibly low risk of complication. And I certainly think, you know, that's what's most important to the patients and that's really what we're obligated to do for them. One, one important thing to add to that too is it's not just the untreated gr group yes. that have, but if you, if you don't have complex karyotype 17P or 11Q, your progression-free survival on ibrutinib is the same as that untreated cohort. Yes. And in our, in our set at OSU, we've not seen a single patient in that group that's, you know, that's relapsed on ibrutinib. They've had, they've had, some of them, some patients have had intolerance. And so, you know, the, uh, I agree, uh, I agree a little bit with Dr. Furman that th these, th these very effective cancer therapies that are patient, you know, that are patient friendly, that allow our, our patients to, you know, to, to live, you know, w with, without their disease, feeling like they did, the most common thing you hear with, the, with patients on these agents is they feel like they did before they had CLL. Mm -hmm. It really falls outside of our, you know, outside of our realm to you know, to solve the pricing problems. That's you know that's that's another you know that's another topic. I would say with you know with ibrutinib with idolisib, you know the programs that are available, you know even for pa patients that can't pay their copay to help, you know really have made it to where you know say I've not had problem getting ibrutinib for any of my patients in the I relapse think, setting. I understand that, John, but I think that those funds are limited, and as more as we use more and more of these agents, the funds are going to run out. Uh, my only concern. Um, I think that that is another topic, but I think what's important, what you just said, and I agree with, with everything, but Rich also, you know, I'd be very cautious about mixing uh, combinations, say that we don't have clear data on. One example was uh, where Gilead actually utilized in their study where they were using two B cell receptor and they used idelalisib in a sick inhibitor, and they had actually very significant uh, incidence of unexpected pneumonitis patients some ended up intubated and uh, very serious toxicity died. and died. So I have to say that we, we have to understand that something that we think by themselves are actually safe and stable and then maybe the combination makes sense. We have to be very cautious that we don't just take it uh, basically for granted that, oh, we can combine this. And especially if you don't have the trials and in, 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 in not the same thing. In practice, you often have to do things that haven't, come, you know, haven't been published yet but I think that with these new agents, we've seen some very unusual complications or things that we haven't seen before. And I think, again, raise a little bit of caution until the studies are done before we start combining them. I think that.